Oh, oh, it says we're now streaming. Is that true? All right. Yes, you are live. Take it away. Thanks, Jack. Randy. Welcome, everybody, to Quarantine Theater's production of Fethu and Her Friends by Maria Irene Fornes. This is actually a reunion reading um, from the theater school at DePaul circa 2008. Uh, we did this fabulous little play, and I'm so thrilled we're all together to do it again. Welcome, guys. Yay. Um, we're all just going to introduce ourselves, and then we'll get started. I'm Brandy. I was the director of this production, and I will be reading the stage directions. Uh, Annie? Hi, I'm Annie, and I'll be reading Christina. Kay? I'm Kay, and I'll be reading Fafu. Mary? Hi, I'm Mary. I'm going to be reading Cindy. Mackenzie. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. I'll be reading Paula. Megan. Hi, I'm Megan. I'll be reading Julia. Tucky. Hi, I'm Tucky. I'll be reading Emma. And Falashe. Hey, I'm Falashe. I'll be reading Sue. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, let's get started. <clears throat> Fethu and her friends, part one. The living room of a country house in New England. The decor is a tasteful mixture of styles. To the right is the foyer and the main door. To the left, French doors leading to a terrace, the lawn, and a pond. At the rear, there are stairs that lead to the upper floor, the entrance to the kitchen, and the entrance to the other rooms on the ground floor. A couch faces the audience. There is a coffee table, two chairs on each side of the table. Upright, there is a piano. Against the right wall, there is an open liquor cabinet. Besides the bottles of liquor, there are glasses, an ice bucket, and a seltzer bottle. A double barrel shotgun leads on the wall near the French doors. On the table, there is a dish with chocolates. On the couch, there's a throw. Fefu stands on the table. Cindy lies on the couch. Christina sits on the chair to the right. My husband married me as a constant reminder of how loathsome women are. What? Yup. That's just awful. No, it isn't. It isn't awful? No. I don't think anyone would marry for that reason. Well, he did. Did he say so? He tells me constantly. Oh dear. I don't mind, I laugh when he tells me. You laugh? <laughs> I do. How can you? It's funny and it's true, that's why I laugh. What is true? That women are loathsome. Fefu. That shocks you? It does. I don't feel loathsome. Well, I don't mean that you are loathsome. You don't mean that I am loathsome. No, no. It's something to think about. It's a thought. It's a hideous thought. I take it all back. Isn't she incredible? Cindy, I'm not talking about anyone in particular. It's just something to think about. No one in particular, just a woman. Yes. Well, in that case, I am relieved. I thought you were referring to us. You're being stupid. Stupid and loathsome. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard anything so outrageous? I am speechless. Why are you speechless? <laughs> you are outrageous. Don't be offended. I don't take enough care to be tactful. I know I don't, but don't be offended. Cindy's not offended. She pretends to be, but she isn't really. She understands what I mean. I do not. Yes, you do. I like exciting ideas. They give me energy. And how is women being loathsome an exciting idea? It revolts me. You find revulsion exciting. Don't you? No. I do. It's something to grapple with. What do you do with revulsion? I avoid anything that's revolting to me. Hmm. You too? Yes. Hmm. Have you ever turned a stone over in damp soil? Mm-hmm. And, and when you turn it, there are worms crawling on it? Mm-hmm. And it's damp and full of fungus. Mm hmm Were you revolted? Yes. Were you fascinated? I was. There, you have it. You two are fascinated with revulsion. Hmm. You see, that which is exposed to the exterior is smooth and dry and clean. That which is not underneath 
is slimy and filled with fungus and crawling with worms. It's another life parallel to the one we manifest. It's there, the way worms are underneath the stone. And if you don't recognize it, it eats you. That's my opinion. Who's ready for lunch? I'll have some fried worms with lots of pepper. You? I'll have mine in a sandwich with mayonnaise. Um, mm, to drink? Just some dirty dishwater and a tall glass of ice. That sounds fine. I'll go dig them up. You haven't met Philip, have you? No. That's him. Which one? That one. Aims and shoots. Oh! Fefu smiles proudly. She blows in the mouth of the barrel. She puts down the gun and looks out again. Christ, Fefu. There he goes. He's up. It's a game we play. I shoot and he falls. Whenever he hears the blast, he falls. No matter where he is, he falls. One time he fell in a puddle of mud and his clothes were a mess. It's not too bad. He was just dusting off some stuff. He's all right. Look. <laughs> a drink? Yes. What would you like? Bourbon and soda. Lots of soda. Ice and bourbon in the glass and starts to squirt the soda. Lots of soda. Mm -mm, just soda. Cindy starts with a fresh glass. Wait. I'll have an ice cube with a few drops of bourbon. Cindy starts with another fresh glass. One or two ice cubes. One. Something to suck on. She's unique. There is no one like her. Thank God. She gives the drink to Christina. But she is lovely, you know. She really is. Yeah, she's crazy. A little. She has a strange marriage. Strange? It's revolting. What is he like? He's crazy, too. They drive each other crazy. They are not crazy, really. They drive each other crazy. But why do they stay together? They love each other. Love? It's love. Who are the other men? Fafu's younger brother, John, and the gardener. His name is Tom. The gun is not loaded. How do you know? It's not. <laughs> Why should it be loaded? It seemed to be loaded a moment ago. <clears throat> well, that was just a blank. Sounded like a cannon shot. It was just gunpowder. There's no bullet in a blank. The blast alone could kill you. One can die of fright, you know. True. My heart is still beating. That's just fright. You're being a scaredy cat. Of course, it's just fright. It's fright. I mean, you were just scared. You didn't get hurt. Just scared. I guess I was lucky I didn't get shot. Fefu will, won't shoot you. She only shoots Philip. Well, that's nice of her. Put the gun away. I, I don't really like looking at it. I just fixed the toilet in your bathroom. You did? I did. The water stopper didn't work. It drained. I adjusted it. I'm waiting for the tank to fill up, make sure it all works. You do your own plumbing? Oh, I just have to bend the metal that supports the rubber stopper so it falls right over the hole. What happened is it fell to the side so the water wouldn't stop running into the bowl. He scared me this time, you know? He looked like he was really hurt. I thought the guns were not loaded. Well, I'm never sure. What? Fefu, what do you mean? He told me one day he'd put real bullets in the gun. He likes to make me nervous. I've upset you. I don't mean to upset you. That's the way we are with each other. We always go to extremes, but it's not anything to be upset about. You scare me. That's all right. I, I, I scare myself too sometimes, but there's nothing wrong with being scared. It makes you stronger. It does me. <laughs> he won't put real bullets in the guns. It, it's just our relationship, the game, I mean. If I didn't shoot him with blanks, I might shoot him for real. Do you see the sense of it? I think you're crazy. No, I'm not. I'm sane. You're very stupid. I'm not. I'm very bright. You depress me. Don't be depressed. Laugh at me if you don't agree with me. Say I'm ridiculous. I know I'm ridiculous. Come on. Come on, laugh. I hate to think I'm depressing you. All right, I'll, I'll laugh. 
I'll make you a drink. No, I'm just sucking on the ice. Don't you feel well? Yeah, I'm all right. What are you drinking? Bourbon. <clears throat> Would you like some more? I'll get you some. Just one drop. Like that? Yes, thank you. That's the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it's cold. You need a stick in the ice, like a popsicle stick. You hold the stick and your fingers won't get cold. I have some sticks, I'll do some for you. Don't trouble yourself. No, no, it won't be any trouble. You might want some later. I'm strange, Christina, but I'm fortunate in that I don't mind being strange. It's hard on others sometimes, but not that hard. Is it, Cindy? Those who love me, love me precisely because I am the way that I am. Isn't that so? I would love you even if you weren't the way you are. You wouldn't know it was me if I weren't the way I am. I would still know it was you underneath. You see, there are some good things about me. I'm never angry, for example. But you make everyone else angry. No. You've made me furious. I know, and I might make you angry again. Still, I would like it if you liked me. You think that's unlikely? I don't know. We'll see. I still like men better than women. I envy them. I like being like a man, thinking like a man, feeling like a man. They are well together. Women are not. Look at them. They're checking the new grass mower out on the lawn in the fresh air while we sit here in the dark. Men have natural strength. Women have to find their strength. And when they do find it, it comes forth with bitterness and it's erratic. Women are restless with each other. They're like live wires, either chattering to keep themselves from making contact or else if they don't chatter, they avert their eyes. Like Orpheus, as if a God once said, and if they shall recognize each other, the world will be blown apart. They're always eager for the men to arrive. And when they do, they can put themselves at rest, tranquilized in a mild stupor. With the men, they feel safe. The danger is gone. That's the closest they can be to feeling wholesome. Men are the muscle that cover the raw nerve. They're the insulators. The danger is gone, but the price is the mind and the spirit. High price, I've never understood it. Why? What's feared? Hmm. Well, do you know perhaps the heavens would fall? Have I offended you again? No. I too have wished for that trust men have for each other. The faith the world puts in them and they in turn put in the world. I know I don't have it. <clears throat> hmm. Well, I have to see how my toilet is doing. Plumbing is more important than you think. Efu exits, puts her head out and smiles. Christina falls off her chair in a mank mock faint. Cindy goes to her. What do you think? <clears throat> I hurt. I'm all shreds inside. Anything I can do? Thing. <clears throat> Later on, we'll conspire mm -hmm. as we dream by the fire. There is the sound of a horn. Fefu enters. It's Julia! Are you all right? Darn it. Yes, darn it. Julia! Let me help you. I can manage. I'm much stronger now. There you go. You have my bag? Yes. Julia and Fefu enter. Julia is in a wheelchair. Hello, Cindy. Hello, darling. How are you? I'm very well now. I'm driving now. You must see my car. It's very clever the way they've worked it all out. You might want to drive it. It's not hard at all. Christina. Hello, Julia. I'm glad to see you. I'll take this to your room. You're down here. You want to wash up? Fefu exits. Julia follows. Can't get used to it. She's better, isn't she? Not really. Was she actually hit by the bullet? No. I was with her. Yeah, I know. 
I, I thought the bullet hit her, but it didn't. How do you know if a person is hit by a bullet? Cindy, there's a wound and there's a bullet. Well, the hunter aimed at the deer. He shot. He? Yes. It wasn't... Fefu? No. She wasn't even there. She used to hunt, but she doesn't hunt anymore. She loves animals. Go on. He shot. Julia and the deer fell. The deer was dead. Dying. Julia was unconscious. She had convulsions, like the deer. He died and she didn't. I screamed for help and the hunter came and examined Julia. He said, she is not hurt. Julia's forehead was bleeding. He said, it's a surface wound. I didn't hurt her. I know it wasn't he who hurt her. It was someone else. He went for help and Julia started talking. She was delirious. Apparently there was a spinal nerve injury. She hit her head and she suffered a concussion. She blanks out and that is caused by the blow on the head. It's a scar in the brain. It's called the petite mal. That's who enters? What was it she said? Hmm? When she was delirious. When she was delirious? That, that she was persecuted. That they tortured her. That they had tried her and that the shot was her execution. That she recanted because she wanted to live. That if she talked about it to anyone, she would be tortured further and killed. And I have not mentioned this before because I, I fear for her. It doesn't make any sense, Cindy. It makes sense to me. You heard. Who hurt her? I don't know. Did you know her? I met her once years ago. Do you remember her then as she was? She was afraid of nothing. Have you ever met anyone like that? She knew so much. She was so young and yet she knew so much. How did she learn all that? Did you ever wonder? Well, I still haven't checked my toilet. Can you believe that? I still haven't checked it. Beth goes upstairs. How long ago was the accident? A year, a little over a year. Is she in pain? I don't think so. We are made of putty, aren't we? There's a the sound of a car, car doors opening and closing, a house window opening. Emma, what is that you're wearing? You look marvelous. I got it in Turkey. <laughs> Hi, Paula, Sue. Hi. Hi. Cindy goes out to greet them. Julia enters. She wheels herself downstage. I'll be right down. Hey, my toilet works. Stephanie, mine does too. Don't be funny. Come down. How are you? Good, good, good. Julia. Emma. It's all right. Take me for a ride. Julia wheels the chair in a circle. Emma waves as they ride. Paula, Sue, Fafu. Do you know Christina? How do you do? How do you do? Sue, Paula. Hello. 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 I like your talk at Flossy Crit. Oh, God, don't remind me. I thought it was awful. Come, I'll show you to your rooms. I thought you weren't. I found it very stimulating. When was that? What was it on? Aviation. It wasn't on aviation. It was on uh, Voltaire de Clare. I wish I had known. It was not important. I would have gone, Fefu. Really, it wasn't worth the trouble. Now you'll have to tell Julia and me all about Voltaire de Clare. <laughs> you know all about Voltaire de Clare. I don't. I'll tell you at lunch. I had lunch. You can sit and listen while we eat. I will. When do we start our meeting? After lunch, we'll have something to eat and then we'll have our meeting. Who's ready for lunch? I'm not really hungry. I am. I can I'm eat ready. now. <laughs> have coffee. Uh, well, uh, we'll take a vote later. What are we doing exactly? 
about lunch? That too, but I meant the agenda. Well, I thought we should first discuss what each of us is going to talk about uh, so we don't duplicate what someone else is saying. And then we have a review of it, a uh, sort of rehearsal. So we know in what order we should speak and how long it's going to take. We should do rehearsal and costume. What color should we wear? It, may, it, it matters. Do you know what you're wearing? I, I haven't thought about that. What color should I wear? Red. Red? Cherry red or white. And I? Dark green. The treasurer should wear green. It suits her too. And, and then we'll speak in, or, in order of color. Right. Who else wants to know? For you, lavender. Purpura. For you, all the gold in Persia. There is no gold in Persia. In Peru. I brought my costume. I'll put it on later. We're not in costume? No, this is just a dress. My costume is dramatic. I won't <laughs> tell you any more about it. You'll see it. I had no idea we were going to do theater. <laughs> mm, life is theater. Theater is life. If we're showing what life is, can be, we must do theater. Will I have to act? It's not acting. It's being. It's bringing forth with the powers of the spirit. It is breathing. I'll do a dance. I'll stage a dance for you. Sitting? On a settee. I'm game. Philip, what are you doing? Hello. Hello, John. What? I'm staging a dance for Julia. We'll never see her again. Come. Fefu, Paula, and Sue go upstairs. Julia goes to the gun, takes it, and smells the mouth of a barrel. She looks at Cindy. It's a blank. Julia takes the remaining slug out of the gun and she lets it fall to the floor. She's hurting herself. Julia goes to the coffee table, takes a piece of chocolate, puts it in her mouth and goes towards her room. After she crosses the threshold, she stops. Julia? She's absent. What do we do? Nothing, she'll be all right in a moment. It's a blank. It is. She's hurting herself. Oh. I must lie down a while. Call me if you need anything. I will. Do you know how to do this? Cindy succeeds in putting the slug in the gun. Cecilia stands on the threshold. I'm Cecilia Johnson. Do I have the right place? Yes. Cindy locks the gun. Lights fade around Cecilia. Only her head is lit. The light fades. Part two, on the lawn. There is a bench or a tree stump. Fefu and Emma bring boxes of potatoes, carrots, beets, winter squash, and other vegetables from a root cellar and put them in a small wagon. Fefu wears a hat and gardening gloves. Do you think about genitals all the time? <laughs> genitals. No, I don't think about genitals all the time. I do, and it drives me crazy. Each person I see in the street, anywhere at all, I keep thinking of their genitals and what they look like, what position they're in. I, I think it's odd that everyone has them, don't you? No, I think it'd be odder if they didn't have them. I mean, people act as if they didn't have genitals. How do people with genitals act? I mean, how can businessmen and women stand in a room and discuss business without even one reference to their genitals? I mean, everybody has them. They just pretend that they don't. Ah, uh, I see. You mean they should do this all the time? <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Think of it. Don't you think I'm right? Yes, I think you're right. Oh, Emma. Emma, 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 Emma. That's my name. Well, you see, <laughs> I definitely believe that you go to heaven if you are good. If you are bad, you go to hell. That is correct. However, in heaven, they don't judge goodness the way we think. They don't. They have a divine registry. 
of sexual performance, in that registry, they mark down every little sexual activity in your life. If your faith is not entirely in it, if you just perform as an obligation and you don't feel the most profound devotion in your spirit, in your heart, and your flesh is not religiously delivered to it, you are condemned. They put down, they put you down in the blacklist and you don't go to heaven. Heaven is populated with divine lovers, and in hell live the duds. That's probably true. I knew you'd see it that way. No, I do. I do. On earth, we are judged by public acts, and sex is a private act. The partner cannot be said to be the public, since both partners are engaged. So naturally, it stands to reason that it's angels who judge our sexual life. Naturally. You always bring me joy. Thank you. I thank you. I am in constant pain. I don't wanna give in to it. If I do, I'm afraid I'll never recover. It's not physical and it's not sorrow. It's very strange, Emma, I can't describe it. And it's very frightening. It is as if normally there's a lubricant, not in the body, a spiritual lubricant it's hard to describe. And without it, life is a nightmare and everything is distorted. A black cat started coming to my kitchen. He's awfully mangled and big. He's missing an eye and his skin is diseased. And at first I was repelled by him, but then I thought this is a monster that has been sent to me and I must feed him and I fed him. And one day he came and shat all over my kitchen, foul diarrhea, and he still comes and I still feed him. I'm afraid of him. Emma kisses Fefu. How about a little lemonade? Yes. How about a game of croquet? Fine. Fefu, Fefu exits. Emma improvises an effigy of Fefu, puts Fefu's hat and gloves on it. Not from the stars do I my judgment pluck, and yet methinks I have astronomy but not to tell of good or evil luck, of plagues or dearths or season's quality. Nor can I fortune to brief minutes tell, pointing to each his thunder, rain, and wind, or say with princes if it shall go well, by oft predict that I in heaven find. But from thine eyes my knowledge I derive, and constant stars in them I read such art as truth and beauty shall together thrive. If from thyself to store thou wouldst convert, or else of thee, this I prognosticate. Thy end is truth and beauty's doom and date. Fefu re-enters with a pitcher and two glasses. In the study. There are books on the walls, a desk, Victorian chairs, a rug on the floor. Christina sits behind the desk. She reads a French textbook. She mumbles French sentences. Cindy sits to the left of the desk with her feet up on the chair. She looks at a magazine. A few moments pass. The lady in Africa divorced her husband because he was a cheetah. Oh dear. Qui voudrait possession in vérité au grand lait? I suppose when a person is swept off, swept off their feet, the feet remain and the person goes off with the broom. <laughs> no. When a person is swept off their feet, there is no broom. What does the sweeping? An emotion, a feeling. Then emotions have bristles? Yes. Now I understand. Do the feet remain? No, the feet fly also, but separate from the body. At the end of the leap, just before the landing, they join the ankles and one is complete again. Oh, that sounds nice. Oh, it is. Being swept off your feet is a nice. Anything else? Not for now. They go back to their reading. 
Are you having a good time? Yes. I'm very glad I came. Do you like everybody? Yes. Do you like Fafu? I do. She confuses me a little. I try to... I try to be honest and I wonder if she is. I don't mean that she doesn't tell the truth. I know she does. I mean a kind of integrity. I know she has integrity too, but I don't know if she's careful with life, something bigger than the self. I suppose I don't mean with life more, but more with convention. I, th I think she is an adventurer in a way. Her mind is adventurous. I don't know if there is dishonesty in that. But in adventure, there is taking chances and risks, and then one has to somehow have less regard or respect for things as they are. That is, regard for a kind of convention, I suppose. I, I am all probably ultimately a conformist, I think, and I suppose I do hold back for fear of being disrespectful or destroying something, and I admire those who are not, but I also feel they are dangerous to me. I don't think they are dangerous to the world. They are more useful than I am, more important. But I feel some of my life is endangered by their way of thinking. Do you understand? Yes, I do. I guess I am proud and I don't like thinking that I am thoughtful of things that have no value. I like her. I had a terrible dream last night. What was it? I was at a dance and there was a young doctor I had seen in connection with my health. We all danced in a circle and he identified himself and said that he had spoken to Mike about me, but that it was all right, that he had put it so that it was all right. I was puzzled as to why Mike would mind and why he had spoken to him. Then suddenly everybody sat down on the floor and pretended they were having singing lessons. And one person was practicing Italian. The singing professor was being tested by two secret policemen. They were having him correct the voice of someone they had brought in. He apparently didn't know how to do it. Then one of the policemen put his hands on his vocal cords and kicked him out the door. Then he grabbed me and felt my throat from behind with his thumbs while he rubbed my nipples with his pinkies. Then he pushed me out the door. Then the young doctor started cursing at me. His mouth moved like the mouth of a horse. I was on an upper level with the railing and I said to him, stop and listen to me. I said it so strongly that he stopped. Everybody turned to me in admiration because I had made him stop. Then I said to him, restrain yourself. I wanted to say, respect me. I wasn't sure whether the words coming out of my mouth were what I wanted to say. I turned to ask my sister. The young man was bending over and trembling in mad rage. Another man told me to run before the young man tried to kill me. Meg and I ran downstairs she asked me if I wanted to go to her place. We grabbed a taxi, but before the taxi got enough speed, he came out and ran to the taxi and was on the verge of opening the door when I woke up. The door opens, Fefu looks in. Who's for a game of croquet? In a little while. See you outside. That was quite a dream. What do you think it means? I think it means you should go to a different doctor. He's not my doctor. I never saw him before. Oh, well, good. I'm sure he's not a good doctor. In the bedroom. A plain unpainted room, perhaps the room that was used for storage and set up for a sleeping pace for Julia. There's a mattress on the floor right to the right of the mattress, there's a small table. To the left, Julia's wheelchair. There is a sink on the wall. There are dry leaves on the floor, though the time is not fall. The sheets are linen. Julia lies in a bed covered to her shoulders. She wears a white hospital gown. Julia hallucinates. However, her behavior is not attributed to a mad person. It's rather still and luminous. 
They clubbed me. They broke my head. They broke my will. They broke my hands. They tore my eyes out. They took my voice away. They didn't do anything to my heart because I didn't bring my heart with me. They clubbed me again, but my head did not fall off in pieces. That was because they were so good and they felt sorry for me. The judges. You didn't know the judges? I was good and quiet. I never dropped my smile. I smiled to everyone. If I stopped smiling, I would get clubbed because they love me. They say they love me. I go along with that because if I don't, I told them the stinking parts of the body are the important ones, the genitals, the anus, the mouth, the armpit, all important parts except the armpits. And who knows, maybe the armpits are important too. That's what I said. He said, all those parts must be kept clean and put away. He said that women's entrails are heavier than anything on earth. And to see a woman in running creates a disparate and incongruous image in the mind. It's anti-aesthetic. Therefore, women should not run. Instead, they should strike positions that take into account the weight of their entrails. Only if they do, can they be aesthetic. He said, for example, Goya's Maha. He said, Ruben's women are not aesthetic, flesh. He said that a woman's bottom should be in a cushion, otherwise it's revolting. He said there are exceptions. Ballet dancers are exceptions. They can run and lift their legs because they have no entrails. Isadora Duncan had entrails. That's why she should not have danced, but she danced. And for this reason, she became crazy. She wasn't crazy. She was. He said that I had to be punished because I was getting too smart. Not smart, I never was. Neither was Fefu smart. They're after her too. Well, she's still walking. No, wait. I'll say my prayers. I'm saying it. You don't think I'm going to argue with them, do you? I repented. I told them exactly what they wanted to hear. They killed me. I was dead. Bullet didn't hit me. It hit the deer, but I died. He didn't. Then I repented and the deer died and I lived. They said, live, but crippled. And if you tell, why do you have to tell kill Fefu? For she's only a joker, not kill her, cure her. Will it hurt? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, my dear, they want your light, your light. Oh my dear, your precious light. Oh dear, my dear, no. Not cry, I'll say my prayer. I'll say it right now. Look, the human being is of the masculine gender. The human being is a boy as a child and grown up, he is a man. Everything on earth is for the human being, which is man, to nourish him. There are evil things on earth and noxious things Evil and noxious things are on earth for man also, for him to fight with and conquer and turn its evil into good so that it too can nourish him. There are evil plants, evil animals, evil minerals, and women are evil. Woman is not a human being. She is one, a mystery, two, another species, three, as yet undefined, Four, unpredictable, therefore wicked and gentle and evil and good, which is evil. If a man commits an evil act, he must be pitied. The evil comes from outside him, through him and into the act. Woman generates evil herself. God gave man no other mate 
but woman. The oxen is good, but it is not a mate for a man. The sheep is good, but it is not a mate for a man. The mate for a man is a woman, and that is the cross man must bear. Man is not spiritually sexual. He, therefore, can enjoy sexuality. His sexuality is physical, which means his spirit is pure. Women's spirit is sexual. That is why after coitus, they dwell in nefarious feelings because that is their natural habitat. That is why it is difficult for them to return to the human world. Their sexual feelings remain with them till they die and they take those feelings with them to the afterlife where they corrupt the heavens and they are sent to hell where through suffering they may shed those feelings and return to earth as man. <laughs> Don't hit me. I just said my prayer. I believe it. They say when I believe the prayer, I will forget the judges. And when I forget the judges, I will believe the prayer. They say both will happen at once. And all women have done it. Why can't I? Sue enters with a bowl of soup on a tray. Julia, are you asleep? No. I brought your soup. Put it down. I'm getting up in a moment. Do you want me to help you? No. I can manage. Thank you, Sue. She goes to the door. You're all right? Yes. I'll see you later. Thank you, Sue. Sue exits. Julia closes her eyes as soon as the audience leaves, the tray is removed. In the kitchen. A fully equipped kitchen. There is a table and chairs, a high cutting table. On a counter next to the stove, there is a tray with the soup dish and a spoon. There is also a ladle. On the cutting table, there are two empty glasses. Soup is heating on a burner. A kettle with water sits on an unlit burner. In the refrigerator, there is an ice tray with wooden sticks in each cube. The sticks should rest on the edge of the tray, forming two parallel rows, like a caterpillar lying on its back. In the refrigerator, there are also two pitchers, one with water, one with lemonade. Paula sits at the table. She's writing on a pad. Sue waits for the, for the soup to heat. I have it all figured out. What? A love affair lasts seven years and three months. It does? Three months of love. One year saying, it's all right. This is just a passing disturbance. One year trying to understand what's wrong. Two years knowing the end has come. One year finding the way to end it. After the separation, two years trying to understand what happened. Seven years, three months. At any point in the sequence, it might be interrupted by another love affair that has the same sequence. That is, or it's not really interrupted. The new love affair relegates the first one and the sec on the second plane and both continue their sequence at the same time. You really added it up. Sure. What do you want to drink? Water. No, the old love affair may fade, so you're not aware the process goes on. A year later, it may suffer, and you might find yourself figuring out what's wrong with the new one while you're still trying to end the old one. So how do you solve the problem? Celibacy. Celibacy doesn't solve anything. That's true. Taking the ice tray out with the sticks. What's this? Dessert? <laughs> Sue takes an ice cube and places it on her forehead. For a forehead. <laughs> Eskimo she wrestling. She takes brain, behind oh. her brain cooler. That's when you are thinking too much. You could use one. She <laughs> takes it behind Paula's ear. They wrestle. This is when you want to keep chaste. No one will kiss you. She puts it in her mouth to demonstrate, takes it out. That's good for celibacy. If you walk, walk around with one of these in your mouth for seven years, 
you can keep all your sequ sequences straight. Finish one before you start the other. She puts the ice cube in the tray and looks at the tray. A frozen caterpillar? She puts the tray away. You're leaving an ice cube in there. I'm clean. So what else do you have on love? Well, the breakup takes place in parts. The brain, the heart, the body, mutual things, shared things. The mind leaves, but the heart is still there. The heart has left, but the body wants to stay. The body leaves, but the things are still at the apartment. So you must come back. You move everything out of the apartment, but the mind stays behind. Memory lingers in place. Seven years later, or perhaps seven years later, it, it doesn't matter anymore. Or perhaps it takes longer, or perhaps it never ends. It depends. Yeah, it depends. Pouring soup in the bowl. Something's bothering you. Taking the tray. No. I'm going to take this to Julia. Go ahead. As Sue exits, Cecilia enters. May I come in? Yeah. Would you like something to eat? No, I, I ate lunch. I didn't eat lunch. I wasn't very hungry. I know. Would you like some coffee? I'll have tea. I'll make some. No, you sit. I'll make it. Here it is. I've been meaning to call you. It doesn't matter. I know you're busy. Still, I, I would have called you, but I really didn't find the time. Don't worry. I, I wanted to see you again. I, I want to see you often. There's no hurry. Now we know we can see each other. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad we can. I thought a great deal about my life since I saw you. I've questioned my life. I can't help but doing that. It's been many years and I just wanted to know how you saw me now. You're the same. I felt small in your presence. I haven't done all that I could have, like all that I wanted to be all I wanted to do. Our lives have gone in such different directions. I can't help but review what those years have been for me. I gave up or I almost gave up. I missed you in my life. I became lazy. I lost the drive. You abandoned me and I kept going. But after a while, I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to go on. I knew why when I was with you, to give you pleasure so we could laugh together, so we could rejoice together to bring beauty to the world. Now, uh, now we look at each other like strangers. We're guarded. I speak and you don't under my, understand my words. I remember every day. Fafu enters. She takes the lemonade pitcher from the refrigerator and two glasses from the top of the refrigerator. Emma and I are gonna play croquet. Wanna join us? No, you are having a serious conversation. Very serious. Too serious. <laughs> Come. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's go play croquet. I'm not reproaching you. I know. I I've missed you too. They exit. As soon as the audience leaves, the props are reset. Part three. The living room. It is dusk. As the audience enters, two or three of the women are around the piano playing and singing Schubert's Who is Sylvia? They exit. Emma enters, checks the lights in the room on her hand, looks around the room and goes upstairs. The rest enter through the real rear. Cecilia enters speaking. Well, we have our own system of receiving information, placing it, responding to it. The system can function with such a bias that it could take any situation and translate it into one formula. That is, I think, the main reason for stupidity or even madness, not being able to tell the difference between things. Like? Like this person is screaming at me. He's a bully. I don't like being screamed at. Another person or the same person screams in a different situation. But you know that you have done something that provokes him to scream. He has a good reason. 
they are two different things, the screaming of one and the screaming of the other. Often that distinction is not made. We cannot survive in a vacuum. We must be part of a community, perhaps 10, 100, 1,000. It depends on how strong you are. But even the strongest will need a dozen, three, even one who sees, thinks, feels as he does. The greater the need for that kind of reassurance, the greater the number that he needs to identify with. Some need to identify with the whole nation. Then the greater the number, the more limited the number of responses and thoughts. The common denominator must be reached. Thoughts, emotions that fit all have to be limited to a small number. That is, I feel, the concern of the educator, to teach how to be sensitive to these differences in ourselves as well as outside of ourselves, not to supervise the memorization of facts. Otherwise, the unusual in us will perish. As we grow, we will feel we are strange and fear any thought that is not shared with everyone. Because I feel I am perishing. My hallucinations are madness, of, of course, but I wish I could be with others who hallucinate also. I would still know I am mad, but I would not feel so isolated. Hallucinations are real, you know. They're not like dreams. They're as real as the rest of you here. I have actually asked to be hospitalized so I could be with the other nuts. The doctors don't want to. They can't diagnose me. That makes me even more isolated. You see right now, it's an awful moment because you don't know what to say or do. If I were with other people who hallucinate, they would say, oh yeah, sure, it's awful. Those dummies, they don't see anything. <laughs> it's not so bad, really. I can laugh at it. Emma is ready, we should start. Come on. Sure. Bafu begins to move to the table. Others help to move the table and enough furniture to clean a space in the center. They sit in a semicircle downstage on the floor facing upstage. Cecilia sits on a chair to the left of the semicircle. All right, I start, right? Right. Bafu goes to the center and faces the others. Emma sits on the steps. Only her head and legs are visible. I talk about the stifling conditions of primary school education, et cetera, et cetera. The project, I know what I'm going to say, but I don't want to bore you with it. We all know it by heart, blah, 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 and so on and so on and so on and so on. And then I introduce Emma. And now, Miss Emma Blake. What? Paula goes next. Does it matter? Of course it matters. Dramatic. Ticks. It has to build. I'm in costume. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Paula Corey will speak on art as a tool for learning. And I tell them about your work you've done at the Institute and community centers, essays, etc. Miss Paula Corey. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I like my fellow educator and colleague, Stephanie Beckman. I'm not an educator. What are you? A do-gooder, a Girl Scout. Well, I like my fellow Girl Scout, Stephanie Beckman say, blah, 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 blah. And I offer the jewels of my wisdom and experience, which I will write down and memorize. Otherwise I would just stand there and stammer and go blank. <laughs> and even if I memorize it, I'm sure I will just stand there and stammer and go blank. I'll work with you on it. Uh, however, after all of our Oh, however, after all, our other colleague, Miss Emma Blake, works with me on it, <laughs> ah, my impulse will burst forth through a symphony of elegance. Breathe in and bow. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Good. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, the incomparable, our precious, dear Emma Blake. Emma walks to the center. She wears a robe which hangs from her arms to the floor. Here we go. <laughs> from the prologue to the science of educational dramatics by Emma Sheridan Fry. She takes a dramatic pose and starts. The whole speech is dramatized by interpretive gestures and movements that cover the stage. Environment knocks at the gateway of the senses. A rain of summons be 
beats upon us day and night. We do not answer. Everything around us shouts against our deafness, struggles with our unwillingness, batters our walls, flashes into blindness, strives to sieve through us at every pore, bagging, fighting, insisting. It shouts, where are you? Where are you? But we are deaf. The signals do not reach us. Society restricts us, school straitjackets us, civilization submerges us, privation rings us, luxury feather beds us. The divine urge is checked. The winged horse balks on the road and we, discouraged, defeated, dismount and burrow into ourselves. The gates are closed and divine urge is imprisoned at the center. Thus, we are taken by indifference that is death. Environment, finding the gates closed, tries to break in. Turned away, it comes another way. Kept back, it stretches its hands to us, always scheming to reach us. Never was suitor more insistent than environment, seeking admission, claiming recognition, signaling to be seen, shouting to be heard. And through the ages, we sit inside ourselves, deaf, dumb and blind and will not stir. Maybe we are not deaf. Perhaps signals reach you. Maybe you stir. The gates give. Eternal urge pushes through the stupor of our senses, making paths to meet the challenging suitor. Windows through which to see him, ears through which to hear him, environment shouting, where are you? And center battering at the inner side of the wall, crying, here I am. And dragging down bars, wrenching gates, prying at portholes, listening at cracks, reaching us everywhere and demanding that sense gates be flung open. The gates are open! Eternal urge stands at the threshold, signaling with venturous flag. An imperious instinct lets us know that all is ours and that whatever anyone has ever known or may have ever known, we will call and claim. A sense of life universal surges through our life individual. We attack the feast of this table with an insatiable appetite that cries for all. What are we? A creation of God's consciousness coming down slowly and painfully into recognition of ourselves. What is personality? A small part of us. The whole of us is behind that angry, hungry rush at the gates of senses. What is civilization? A circumscribed order in which the whole has not entered. What is environment? our mate, our true mate that clamors for our reunion. We will meet him. We will seize all, learn all, know all here that we may fare further on the great quest. The task of now is only a step toward the task of the whole. Let us seek the laws governing real life forces that coming into their own, they may create, develop and reconstruct let us awaken life dormant. Let us boldly, seizing the star of our intent, lift it as a lantern of our necessity and let it shine over the darkness of our compliance. Come, the light shines. Come, it brightens our way. Come, don't let its glorious light pass you by. Come, the day has come. Oh, it's so beautiful. It is, Emma. It is. Encore. Encore. Environment knocks at the gateway. <laughs> What's next? I introduced Cecilia. I, I don't think I should introduce Cecilia. She should just come after Emma. Now things don't need an introduction. They are happening. Right. Well, as we say in the business, that is a very hard act to follow. Not very hard. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> right. I should say my name first. Yes. <laughs> I should breathe, too. She takes a breath, all except Polly's 
Paula starts singing Cecilia. Cecilia is perplexed and walks backwards till she sits on the couch. She sits next to Paula, unaware of who she is next to. She puts her hand on Paula's leg. At the end of the song, Cecilia realizes that she is next to Paula and stands. I should go before Emma. I don't think anyone should speak after Emma. Right. It should be Fafu, Paula, Cecilia, then Emma, and then Sue explaining the finances and asking for pledges. And the money should roll in. It's very good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes uh, blah 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 pledges and money <laughs> who's ready for coffee and dishes i'll help me too don't all come sit sit you've done enough relax they put the furniture back as Emma and Sue jump over the couch, making loud, warlike sounds. As they exit to the kitchen, Sue tries to get ahead of Emma. Emma speeds ahead of her. All except Julia jump over the couch. All except Cindy and Julia exit. I should go do the dishes. I haven't done anything. You can do them tomorrow. True. So, how have you been? Hmm. Let me see. I can tell by looking at your face. Not so bad. Not so bad. There is a sound of laughter from the, the kitchen. Christina runs in. <laughs> They're having a water fight over who's going to do the dishes. <laughs> Emma. And Paula and Sue, all of them. Fefu was getting into it when I left. Cecilia got out the back door. Christina <laughs> walks back to the kitchen with some caution. She runs back and lies on the couch, covering her head with the throw. Emma enters with a pan of water in her hand. She is wet. Cindy and Julia point to the lawn. Emma runs to the lawn and there is a sound of knocking from upstairs. While the following conversation goes on, Emma, Sue, Cindy, and Julia engage in water fights in and out of the living room. Their screams, laughter, and water splashing may drown out the words. Open up! There's no one in here! Open up, you coward! I can't, I'm busy. What are you doing? I have a man in here. Oh, 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 okay, I'll wait, take your time. It's gonna take quite a while. It's all right, I'll wait. Do me a favor. Sure, open up and I'll do you a favor. <laughs> There's the sound of a pot falling, a door slamming. Fill it up for me. Okay. Thank you. Here's water, open up. Leave it there. I'll come out in a minute. Okay, here it is. I'm leaving. Walk, walk, walk. (laughs) Paula comes down with a field pan. Emma hides by the entrance to the steps. Emma splashes water on Paula. Paula splashes water on Emma. Sue appears with a full pan. Truce! Who's the winner? You are. You do the dishes. I'm the winner. You do the dishes. Line up! (laughs) Sue splashes water on them. Please don't. (laughs) Truce, truce. Okay, line up. Get in there. Start doing those dishes. I'll go to the kitchen. It's over. (laughs) We're safe. (laughs) You can come up now. You rather wait a while? I feel danger lurking. She's been hiding all day. Fefo enters. She is wet. I won. I got them working. I thought the fight was over who'd do the dishes. Yeah. I have to go change. I'm soaked. They forgot what the fight was about. We did. That's usually the way it is. Going to Christina and lifting the cover off of her face. Are you ready for an ice cube? Fefo exits upstairs. Christina runs upstairs. There's silence. So... And how have you been? All right. I've been taking care of myself. You look well. I do not. Have you seen Mike? No, not since Christmas. I'm sorry. I'm okay. And how's your love life? (laughs) Far away. I have no need for it. I'm sorry. Don't be... Very morbid these days. I think of death all the time. Oh, anyone for coffee? Anyone take milk? Okay. Should we go in? I'll bring it out. I 
feel we are constantly threatened by death. Every second, every instant, it's there. And every moment, something rescues us. Something rescues us from death every moment of our lives. For every moment we live, we have something to thank. We have to be grateful to something that fights for us and saves us. I have felt lifeless in the face of death. Death is not anything, it's being lifeless. And I have felt lifeless sometimes for a brief moment, but I've been rescued by these guardians. I'm not sure who these guardians are. I only know they exist because I felt their absence. I think we have to come to know them as life and we have become familiar with certain forms they take. Our sight is a form they take. That is why we take pleasure in seeing things and we find some things beautiful. The sun is a guardian. Those things we take pleasure in usually are guardians. We enjoy looking at the sunlight when it comes in from the window, don't we? We, as people, are guardians to each other when we give love. And then, of course, we have white cells and antibodies protecting us. Those moments when I feel lifeless have occurred, and I'm afraid one day the guardians won't come in time, and I will be defenseless. I will die for no apparent reason. Paula stands in the doorway with a bottle of milk. Anyone take rotten milk? <laughs> I'm kidding. This one's no good, but, but there's more. Forget it, it's not a good joke. It's good. Uh, in there it seemed funny, but in here it isn't. It's a kitchen joke, bye. It is funny, Paula. It was funny. It's all right. Paula doesn't mind. I'm sure she minds. I'll go see. <laughs> hey, who was that lady I saw you with? That was no lady. That was my rotten wife. <laughs> that one wasn't good either, was it? Emma, that one wasn't good either. She starts to carry a tray with sugar, milk, and two cups of coffee. She stops at the doorway to look at Paula and Emma, who are behind the wall. What are you doing? Uh, what? Oh, okay. Okay. Sue puts the tray down. They're plotting something. Paula appears in the doorway. Ladies and gentlemen, since our material is too shocking and avant-garde, we have decided to uplift our subject matter so it's more palatable to the sensitive public. Yeah. Say cheese. Cheese. <laughs> that was a good one. Success, success. Make it clean and you'll succeed. Coffee's in the kitchen. Oh, I brought theirs out. Oh, should we have it here? We can all go in the kitchen. They each take their coffee and go to the kitchen. Sue takes the tray to the kitchen. The sugar remains on the table. Either here nor there. I'm exhausted. Cecilia enters from the lawn. Is the war over? Yes. It's nice out. Where's everybody? In the kitchen, having coffee. We must talk. Not now. I'll call you. When? I, I don't know. I don't want you, you know. I know. No, you don't. I'm not lusting after you. I know that. I'll call you. When? As soon as I can. I won't be home then. When will you be home? I'll check my book and let you know. Do that. I'll be leaving after coffee. I'll say goodbye now. Goodbye. Cecilia goes towards the kitchen. Paula starts to step towards the steps. Fefu comes down the steps. You're still wet. I'm gonna go change now. Do you need anything? No, I have something I can change, thanks. Paula goes upstairs. Fefu stands by the steps. She's downcast. 
As the lights shift to an eerie tone, Julia enters in slow motion walking. She goes to the coffee table, gets the sugar bowl, lifts it to Fefu's direction, takes the cover off, puts it back on, and walks to the kitchen. As soon as Julia exits, Sue's voice is heard speaking the following lines. Immediately after, Julia re-enters, wheeled by Sue. Cindy, Christina, Emma, and Cecilia are with them. On the arms of the wheelchair rests a tray with the coffee pot and cups. As they reach the couch and chairs, they sit. Sue puts the table puts the tray on the table. Fafu stares at Julia. I was terribly exhausted and run down. I lived on coffee so I could stay up all night and do my work. And they used to give us these medical checkups all the time. But all they did was ask how we felt and we'd all say fine. And they'd check us out. In the meantime, I, I looked like a ghost. I was all bones. Remember Susan Austin? She was very naive. And when they asked her how she felt, she said she was nervous and she wasn't sleeping well. So she had to see a psychiatrist from then on. Well, she was crazy. No, she wasn't. No, she wasn't. God, those were awful days. Remember Julie Brooks? Sure. She was a beautiful girl. Oh, yes. She was gorgeous. Paula comes down the stairs, and as soon as she has changed, she sits on the steps halfway down. At the end of the first semester, they call her in because she had been out with 28 men, and they thought she, she, and they thought that was awful. And the worst thing was after that, she thought there was something wrong with her. She was an infomaniac, that's all. She was not. She was just very beautiful, so all the boys wanted to go out with her. And if a boy asked her to go have a cup of coffee, she'd sign out and write in the name of the boy. None of us, none of us did, of course. All she did was go out for coffee or go to a movie. She was really very in innocent. And Gloria Schumann, she wrote a psychology paper. The faculty decided she didn't write and they called her in to try to make her admit she hadn't written it. She insisted she wrote it and they sent her to a psychiatrist also. Everybody ended up going to the psychiatrist. Fefo enters to the foray. After a few visits, the psychiatrist said, don't you think you know me well enough now that you can tell me the truth about the paper? He almost drove her crazy. They just couldn't believe that she was so smart. Those were difficult times. We were young, that's why it was so difficult. On my first year, I thought you were all very happy. I'd been so deprived in my childhood that I believed the rich were all happy. During the summer, you spent your vacations in Europe or the Orient, and I went to work and I, I resented that. But then I realized that many lives are ruined by poverty and many lives are ruined by wealth. I was always able to manage. And I think I enjoyed myself as much when I went to Revere Beach on my days off as when you guys visited the Taj Mahal. Cecilia enters from the foyer. She stands and listens. Paula doesn't acknowledge her. Then when I stopped feeling envy, I started noticing the waste. I began feeling contempt for those who, having everything a person could ask for, make such a mess of it. I resented them because they were not better than the poor. If you have all that you need, you should be generous. If you can afford to go to school, your mind should be better. If you don't have to fight for your place on earth, you should be nobler. But I saw them cheating and grabbing like kids in the slums or wasting away with self-indulgence. And I saw them be plain stupid. If there is a reason why some are rich, why others starve, it must be so that they can put everything they have into the service of others. They should take the responsibility of everything that happens in the world. They are the ones who can influence things. The poor don't have the power to change things. I think we should teach the poor and let the rich take care of themselves. I'm sorry, I know that's what we're doing. That's what Emma has been doing. I'm sorry, I guess, I just feel like it's not enough. I'll go wash my face, I'll be right back. I think very highly of all of you. Cecilia follows her, Paula turns. Cecilia opens her arms and puts them around Paula, engulfing her. She kisses Paula on the lips. Paula steps back. She's fearful. Cecilia follows her. Fafu enters from the lawn. 
Have you been out? The sky is full of stars. Emma, Sue, Christina, and Cindy exit. What's the matter? Stay a moment, will you? Of course. Did you have enough coffee? Yes. Did you find the sugar? Yes, there was sugar in the kitchen. What's the matter? Can you walk? I'm sorry, my dear. What is the matter? I don't know, Julia. Every breath is painful for me. I don't know. I think you know. No, I don't know. I haven't seen much of you lately. I have thought of you a great deal. I always think of you. Cindy tells me how you are. I always ask her. How is Philip? Things are not well with Philip? No. What's wrong? A lot is wrong. He loves you. He can't stand me. He loves you. He's left me. His body is here, but the rest is gone. I exhaust him. I torment him and I torment myself. I need him, Julia. No, you do. No, I need him. I need his kiss. I need the person he is. I can't give him up. I look into your eyes and I know what you see. It's death. Fight! I can't. I saw you walking. No, I can't walk. You came for sugar, Julia. You came for sugar. Walk. You know I can't walk. Why not? Try, get up, stand up. What is wrong with you? You have given up. I get tired. I get exhausted. I am exhausted. What is it you see? What is it you see? Where is it you go that tires you so? I can't spend time with others. I get tired. What is it you see? You want to see it too? No, I don't. You're nuts and willingly so. You know I'm not. And you're contagious. I'm going mad too. I try to keep away from you. Why? I might be harmful to you. Why? I am contagious. I can't be what I used to be. You have no courage. You're being cruel. I want to rest, Julia. How does a person rest? I want to put my mind at rest. I'm frightened. Don't look at me. I lose my courage when you look at me. May no harm come to your head. Fight. May no harm come to your will. Fight, Julia. I have no life left. Fight, Julia! May no harm come to your hands. I need you to fight. May no harm come to your eyes. Fight with me. May no harm come to your voice. Fight with me! May no harm come to your heart. She pulls Julia off the wheelchair. Christina enters. Fefu sees Christina, releases Julia to Christina. I've done it, haven't I? You think I'm a monster. Forgive me if you can. I forgive you. Fefu gets the gun. What in the world are you doing with that gun? I'm going to clean it. I think you better not. You're silly. I don't care if you shoot yourself. I just don't like the mess you're making. Fefu starts the lawn. I enjoy betting there won't be a real bullet. You want to bet? No. Are you all right? Can I get you anything? Put some sugar in it. Can I have a damp cloth for my forehead? I didn't tell her anything, did I? I didn't. About what? She knew. There is a sound of a shot. Christina and Cecilia run out. Julia puts her hand to her forehead. Her hand goes down slowly. There is blood on her forehead. Her head falls back. Fefu enters holding a dead rabbit. Killed it. I just shot and killed it. 
Julia. Dropping the rabbit, Fefu walks to Julia and stands behind her, behind the chair. She looks at Julia. Sue and Cindy enter from the foyer. Emma and Paula from the kitchen. Christina and Cecilia from the lawn. They surround Julia. The lights fade. End of play. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you guys, you guys are awesome. I mean, really, it, it's like, it's like you haven't missed a beat. You've been doing it this whole time. So does anybody want to say anything or talk about anything while we still have an audience? I don't know how to discuss this play if I- I know, it's really hard. I can say that I really, I really love the parts that are the most abstract. Like when Julia is in her bed talking to the judges, like that should be the craziest part, but it's the part that I feel the like I understand the most. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else. Yeah. 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 Like the scene where you can actually tell what's going on, but it's like, okay, they're preparing for some type of performance. That's mm -hmm. the scene where I'm like, man, I really don't know what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I still don't understand, like, I, I know that, that the first gunshot hit the deer and it did not hit Julia. And the same thing at the end, she, the, gun, the bullet clearly hits the rabbit and yet Julia suffers the consequences. There's something metaphorically in there that I wish I could wrap my brain around, um, but I don't think I'm there yet. I have somewhere I can't find where I put them right now, but I've got like all our old notes and like dramaturgy notes about like the symbolism of deer and rabbits and fertility. And, but then even in the context of what all the women talk about dying or being killed or being taken, it's not necessarily the symbolic elements of like sweetness or fertility. It's almost kind of the opposite of that that's being taken. Yeah, like I think their, their power and their voice. Yeah, so to, to the situation at the time. It. You know, that time period and how hard it was for women. I think it, metaphorically it's speaking for how hard it was for women and sort of the desperation that she felt when she was writing it. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like even when we did it at the time with all of the work that we put into it, um, I feel like on like some days I understood it in like a really visceral way. Like I felt that I understood it in my body. I couldn't explain it, you know, but um, but there was some part of me that did. And I felt that at times during this reading, um, I got like very cold during Julia's speech. I got like just very chilly, um, but it is such a, it is such a puzzle. It like, oh man, it's kind of astounding, but it's also a, a terrible headache, I think. <laughs> well, and the whole idea that there are scenes that are happening at the same time yeah. in different rooms, like literally, yeah. uh, you know, it's not clear when you're just reading it all the way through, but that audience is moving to different places. Yeah. And which I think is really interesting concept. To do this in my house. Do site specific in a house. I know. Cool. I'm, in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm curious how it would, I've always been really curious, like how it would be different and how it would line up if it was kind of in an intimate quarter like that and overlapping. Yeah. It was really I, wonderful to see you all reading this and especially like 15 years having gone by and all of us having had different life experiences. And I know that my kind of my experience of like losing my career and becoming a mother and there was a lot of this that related in a really different and painful and visceral way. And just like, I have a different relationship I think with the patriarchy now than I had when I was in grad school and felt completely realized and free and it, I think it's and just seeing all of you older and with different experiences reading the parts is moving to me thank you good job powerful ladies I, yeah I agree oh sorry go ahead. even Falashay do you I mean I know that you weren't a part of this with us so just hearing it out loud tonight is there anything that you got that would be enlightening to us because I think we're so deep in it that we can't see the forest for the trees well I actually 
remember as we kept reading I kept remembering seeing it (laughs) and so I was like oh wait I I saw this I saw this so that was that was cool um I I do remember like going to different spaces and stuff and watching uh and, and kind of traveling around and I don't know. It was was cool. I mean, this is a weird (laughs) little situation, this play. It's a weird situation, but I I have to agree that the more abstract parts really do make more sense, which in a weird way makes, is probably on purpose to make you feel just as crazy as (laughs) Yeah, I feel like um, I second what Megan said, first of all, it's just like, it was so cool and interesting to hear it later and people are in different cities and had different life experiences. And um, I like uh, to what Fauci was saying, like, I think more it resonates more like how the absurdist moments are more like open scenes like a b a b that can kind of like weave in and out and then they're all grounded in these very like um very realistic funny moments of like a water fight and like the and, like emma's beautiful like dramatic you know and so it's it's i'm i'm seeing how kind of brilliant it is that like it's not just absurdist throughout like inesco can just like phew, go it's like it's like what and then oh grounded moment and like what and then and that was cool to me this time and um uh Julia's monologue yeah like I heard it in a totally new way and I was even like because I know I know what this play too you can be like that's the okay and then the next time you're like nope nope that's not it uh maybe this is but so this time and just this time I was like oh wow like that moment that Kay and Megan just read at the end like um Megan when you say or when Julia says that she's worried that they're after Kay like it was like oh wow and then and then Kay's asking your character to fight and to fight. And you're like, I can't. It's almost like you gave up. It's like there's this sacrifice I saw in a different way that like you sacrificed for Kay's character in the end. It's like whatever you had left, you like threw at Kay in this weird second plane so that Kay can go on and like do the. I know. I feel like I didn't realize that was definitely what it was. Like she wasn't allowed to tell me the thing. And I don't remember that from <laughs> doing it in college at all. And I totally got it this time. It's so clear. Yeah. It's awesome. Just remember a lot of viewpoints in a wheelchair, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely remember feeling very connected to the poeticness of it in college. Like the parallel of us like making this play with them like coming up with this fundraiser speech for arts education, I guess. Yeah. And I remember like feeling in a heightened sense of emotion, like a lot of the time we're in school. And uh, anyway, I enjoyed having time away from it to come back because I felt like all of the poetic moments that in my mind, I was like really feeling in college, like I was leaning into trying to make sound, you know, beautiful and whimsical. Cause that was like my thing. I like now feel like some of those lines are so real like I have thought like men are the muscle that cover the raw nerve like I'm not proud that I think of that all the time but I that is that line has occurred to me so many times um and there's other ones that are in there but I just feel like that is it's like not a metaphor anymore (laughs) yeah in a very understanding in hearing you all say it there was an understanding that wasn't there before Mm -hmm. just I think with the maturity that we all yeah yeah, that's what, kind of what I was going to say too. All the talk of like how it lo- how long it takes to get over a relationship and, God, and so even, a lot of the stuff that Paula says too. A, a lot of Paula's stuff was really interesting to me. That monologue about the poor and uh, that hit me really like in a much more like real way. Um, and yeah, all of the talk of the, how long it takes to get over a relationship, all of those things. You're like, yeah, I didn't really have a huge grasp on that when I was like 21. <laughs> yeah. As totally. I was saying it, I was like, wow, I remember the amount of work I put in trying to wrap my head around what I was talking about. <laughs> and now it's like, oh, yeah, it's seven years. That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'm going to turn us off of live stream, but we're going to keep talking and chatting because I want to know everything that's going on with you guys. But those of you who are watching, thanks for watching. And...